Welcome back to the Richard Roper Podcast. We are back in the saddle again. Thanks to everybody who's been listening and downloading and sharing and all that good stuff. I am indeed Richard Roper. What is your favorite TV theme song of the 21st century? Think about it. Going all the way back now. Let me see. Let me do my math. 23 years, nearly a quarter century of TV theme songs, whether we're talking streaming or good old fashioned broadcast. Think about it. Uh, Our friends at Rotten Tomatoes recently came out with their list of the 25 top TV theme songs of this century. I've got my list as well. You might start humming them as you think about it. Also, we got a bunch of reviews coming up on the Richard Roper podcast. But first, here's your reminder that the Richard Roper show is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. The digital landscape is changing rapidly. And to compete in today's online business environment, you need an experienced partner. Since 1995, AmericanEagle.com has partnered with companies of all sizes, offering web design, web development, e-commerce, mobile apps, digital marketing, all of that to drive your overall business's success because they believe that today's online world is your online opportunity. All right, TV theme song. You know, it's interesting when you go back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and if even if you weren't around then you've you've uh, watched a lot of these shows i'm sure in reruns and a lot of the theme songs told the whole story of of the series uh you know like the gilligan's island uh theme where they sang and they told you all about the the seven idiots who got stranded on gilligan's island uh, some of them were instrumental, you know, whether it was the Dick Van Dyke show or the famous whistling uh, theme to the Andy Griffith show. And then I think when we got more into the 70s, you got uh, You're Gonna Make It After All, the Mary Tyler Moore theme. Remember that one? And then the 80s cheers. And some of them uh, recorded with uh, vocals, others featuring just, you know, great memorable music hooks. You heard that opening piano strain to the Hill Street Blues theme and you were ready to go. ER had that very powerful and emotional opening theme, which is one of the things I want to talk about here, guys. When we talk about TV theme songs, to me, you know, there really are three elements that go into it. Obviously, there's the musical theme itself. And whether it's, you know, something that's done by a fairly well-known group or a vocalist or it has lyrics or it's a cool instrumental that obviously is the is the primary thing but uh just as important really to me are the visuals that go along with the theme sometimes it's just you know highlights from the show sometimes they film specific things for the opening credits going back of course to mary tyler moore you know uh throwing her hat in the air or like the the theme from the office where you get the uh that kind of home video type footage very early 2000s of Scranton, Pennsylvania, which was actually shot by John Krasinski who played Jim Halpert. He actually shot that video on a trip to Scranton doing a little research for the role. Uh so I think you know the visuals that accompany the theme are super important. And you you know they they go hand in hand of course. Something that's kind of, you know, very simple but effective other times it's something that's really done beautifully and we'll get into that in a little bit and then of course the third element is the quality of the show itself i mean i'm sure there are some terrific theme songs that kind of got lost to the winds because they were accompanying not great tv shows so it's got to be a show you love or why would you give a shit about the theme you know the theme is all about getting you in the mood to see the show again now We all know that on Netflix and other streaming services, when you're watching your favorite shows, uh, they almost always now give you the option to skip the episode recap and to skip the theme song. And I get that. Sometimes you don't really need to sit through the entire theme, even if it's something you love. If you've seen the show a million times and you're just rewatching it and having fun with it, I mean, like The Sopranos, for example, which obviously is a great and memorable theme song, but it's one of the longer ones in, in TV history as we follow uh, Tony Soprano, his whole journey uh, back home, you know. And if you've seen the show, you're in your second uh, binge of it or something, you might not want to sit through the theme again. But I, for the most part, I like to sit through and not sit through, but just really re-experience the theme to get in the mood. All right, so let's go to Rotten Tomatoes. Our friends at Rotten Tomatoes uh, came up with their list, and I don't think they did it in uh, order like 25 down to 1. I don't think they did a countdown from what I can tell. It's just their list of the best TV theme songs of the last 25 years. Uh, they include Ted Lasso, 
which is one of those Mumford guys does that, right? I like the Ted Lasso theme. It's very quick, and it's just actually the end of a pop song. Uh, and we see Ted settling into the bleachers, and then the, the, the colors change and everything. It spells out Ted Lasso. Quick, effective, gets you in the mood. Uh, they also mentioned the White Lotus. I, you know, I, the, the the visuals are, for the White Lotus are really cool. And in fact, a lot of the streaming series, especially in the last, I want to say, seven years or so, they have these gorgeous animated, in some cases, uh, VFX, all kinds of cool things, these gorgeous title sequences. A lot of the true crime ones kind of follow the same pattern. You get kind of a an eerie song, haunting melody, and kind of shadowy images and graphics that kind of shimmer like the water where the body was found. They're very well done, but there's a certain similarity to them. And then there's stuff that also has just this really cool animation. I'm not going to go through all the Rotten Tomatoes ones, but they also mentioned Big Bang Theory. Uh, that's uh, Bare Naked Ladies, right? They did that. I'm not a huge fan of the Big Bang, Bang Theory, to tell you the truth. I mean, the performances are good. Uh, the writing is solid. I just never really, really got into it. But I know they had that really fast zippity doo da theme from the Bare Naked Ladies. Dawson's Creek. I knocked. Oh, was that? Uh, that was I Don't Want to Wait by Paula Cole was the theme for that. I, I was trying to remember that because I really wasn't a target audience for Dawson's Creek. But that's a great song, right? Let's listen to a little I Don't Want to Wait by Paula Cole. They also mentioned The Mandalorian, uh, 30 Rock, which has that kind of uh, 1940s big band uh, jazzy uh, feel with the cast members kind of mugging for the camera. Fits the mode and the mood and the tone of the show perfectly. Uh, Six Feet Under, and I admit, I know it's a critically acclaimed show, guys. I haven't seen everything. I've only seen a few episodes of Six Feet Under, so I have no special affinity for those uh, opening credit themes. Oh, Dexter. Now, Dexter was interesting because it had that very, uh, it was called Blood Theme. Daniel Lick did it. Um, and what I liked about Dexter was, I think this is a case, guys, actually where the visuals make the theme because it's got this almost kind of jaunty, catchy uh, melody, uh, which is a little creepy, but it becomes super creepy because the act of getting ready in the morning, everything looks violent. You know, just the the mere act of uh, flossing or cutting into fruit or shaving, all of it looks very violent. It was brilliantly done in a very creepy fashion. Uh, Law and order, of course, you can't go wrong there. Uh, if you're in any hospital waiting room or place or maybe wait for your car in the car wash, you know, you're probably going to hear the law and order theme or if you go visit your grandma during the day. Uh, Doctor Who is mentioned. The Walking Dead is a really good one. That's uh, among the list that uh, Rotten Tomatoes has. The Walking Dead, because again, and especially when the first few years of The Walking Dead, when we didn't know that much about it, I mean, that kind of those swirling strings. Uh, and again, the really, really creepy images. Uh, the Simpsons, you got to mention that. They have friends, the Rembrandts, I'll be there for you. I mean, you ca I guess you kind of have to list it. List it. Certainly is one of the most memorable theme songs of the last 25 years. I know a lot of us, myself included, got really sick of that song really fast. It's almost designed to do that. And even the opening, you know, whatever. We, we've talked enough about friends. It, it, it has its place in pop culture history. I don't think it holds up as well as certain shows like Seinfeld and The Office, but that's just me. They also mentioned Shrinking, a newer show. Uh, the Frightening Fishes is the main title theme from Shrinking, which is a Apple TV Plus uh, show that I love with uh, Jason Siegel and Harrison Ford. Those are some of the theme songs mentioned by Rotten Tomatoes. I'm going to give you my list. Uh, I think I got, what do I have here? I, you know, I don't, I got like six or seven. These are my favorite. I am actually going to go in order here from great to my absolute favorite of this century, guys. So first of all, I want to give kind of a, a, a quirky shout out, if you will, to Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. 
two of the briefest theme songs in television history, but perfect. That those just that little sting for Breaking Bad with the elements, and then Better Call Saul, uh, which would change you know the actual visuals from time to time, but had that same kind of again that kind of just funky scene setting thing, and it's literally like a couple of seconds. Let's listen to the entirety of the theme from Breaking Bad. Ready? Ta-da! Uh, I'm also going to mention Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, that is one of the most famous things. And that's that's a, a theme song that people love to use for memes and all those kinds of funny parody videos where there's some sort of epic fail and then you just play the theme uh, from Curb along with it. It works perfectly. Let's listen to that. That's actually interesting. Um, the music is from a 1974 Italian film called La Bellissima Estetta, something like that. Uh, and Larry David, I think he heard it somewhere on NPR as a little interstitial song or something and thought that's perfect for for the misadventures of his kind of exaggerated version of himself. Great stuff. Uh, Modern Family is one that did not get mentioned by Rotten Tomatoes, but I dig it. What I love about the modern family that again, that sort of kind of jazz Gabriel Mann did the 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 theme, that kind of jazzy pop funky stuff is it's kind of anachronistic in a way, and yet it fits perfectly. And there's always a great intro to modern family, and then they go to the theme, and then it's just the family holding the picture. Uh gets you in the mood every time. And that's a a, a very uh a show that's very repeatable, if you will. I, I love watching modern family, it's great comfort viewing. Definitely want to include uh, the theme from Mad Men. Now, you got to remember when Mad Men came out in 2007, there wasn't a ton of advanced hype for this show. The cast was not that well known, and people were like, What is this? A show about ad executives in the 60s? In fact, Beck, the famous musician Beck, he turned down uh, Matthew Weiner, who created the show, asked him if he'd like to do the theme song. And he's like, For what? I, I, no, uh, I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, so the, the Mad Men song, which I think was actually written for something else, worked out perfectly. And um, it just captures, again, the, and the titles are so cool, the title cards with uh, basically Don Draper, you know, an animated version of him falling and all these cool kind of uh, symbolic things happening. So that theme really works, really works well. Uh, in that same vein, Game of Thrones, uh, just a great theme song. Let's take a listen to that. one that even though it was long and it had that really really cool animated opening i never when I, if i'd watch it you know 
after it came out and I had the option of skipping the credits or even just fast forwarding on a DVR. I never did it because I love that music. It's so perfect. So fits uh, the theme of the show and got me in the mood every time. And that's the same with Succession. My next pick, uh, Nicholas Bertel does that kind of classical piano thing, but there's a little bit of a hip hop uh, beat going on as well. And I love the opening uh, scenes for Succession. which, you know, is shows the family and it's all done kind of very shadowy home movie movie esque, if you will, uh, but really captures the essence of the characters. You see, you see this whole movie stuff, then uh, they interject modern day things showing this, you know, huge media conglomerate, the helicopters flying over Manhattan, very, you know, cool, badass stuff. But the little snippets where you see actors portraying the younger versions of the main characters, and you can just see how their father dominated their lives and how their lives were you know, very privileged, but also very cold and distance, distant. It's really just a perfectly done. If they have awards, they should have for opening credits. Succession should be a, a, a definite winner. Uh, my favorite two then, guys. I'm going to start with uh, The Sopranos. Woke up this morning by Alabama 3. We mentioned Sopranos earlier. And yeah, it's long, but it's great. And that's one of those theme songs that you actually, you know, can listen to without even watching the show. A lot of these songs, you're not going to download, you know, I don't think the theme for Modern Family to play it while you're working out or are, are taking a hike. But uh, Woke Up This Morning by Alabama 3, hell yeah. Interesting, they got paid uh, about 500 bucks originally to use the song, but to the credit of the showrunners and the people behind the show, they've paid them royalties throughout and they've made, I think, like a half a million dollars, you know, something like 500,000 bucks in royalties through the years from that song as well. They should. And my pick, my personal favorite as the top TV theme song of the 21st century, Friday Night Lights. <laughs> That's uh, W.G. Snuffy Walden, who's done a lot of a lot of great music work, a session musician, a lot of uh, soundtrack and and titles. I just love, I, you know, that's that's a theme, an opening theme. The opening credits for Friday Night Lights. We're talking about the TV series, not the movie. Love the movie as well, but the TV series. Were, and the, it takes you on this journey, and the credits change through the years because different actors uh, join the cast, but. You can almost cry at the end of the opening titles for Friday Night Lights because it takes you on the same sort of journey that the show did in nearly every episode where it was inspirational and funny and warm and then almost always something that got you right in the Adam's apple, if you will, and would get you choked up. I love 
the theme from Friday Night Lights. Let me know your favorites. You guys can always reach me uh, on the site for uh, the podcast, of course, on AmericanEagle.com, or you can email me at rroper at suntimes.com. I know a lot of you have known that email address because I've had it. For as long as we've had email addresses, basically, R Roper, all lowercase, R R O E P E R, at suntimes.com. And I, I do get a lot of feedback. Uh, I do appreciate I heard from somebody recently saying you have too many commercial breaks. And I'm like, you know, we really just have two. We have our sponsor, AmericanEagle.com, at the top of the show. And then, of course, we have Portillo's. And you know what? Let's take a listen to me telling you about Portillo's. All right, kids, let's talk about Portillo's. It's one of my favorite places to eat on the planet Earth. My delivery history will bear this out. I also happen to live within walking distance of one of the Chicago Portillo's. Yes, that's right. I'm that lucky. It is amazing. You could order from the restaurant or the drive-thru, but if it's not near you, you can go to Portillo's.com, Portillo's.com and order. They got French fries. They got all kinds of comfort food. The amazing hot dogs, the Italian beef, the Italian sausage, some really good salads, by the way, if you want to take it a little bit easy because you want to have a little bit room left for the chocolate cake, the best chocolate cake in the world. Think about it. Portillo's.com. P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O-S.com. That's how you spell it. Portillo's.com. Great Dom Toretto. If you never would have gotten behind that wheel, I'd never be the man I am today. And now, I am the man who's going to break your family. Piece by piece. The devil's coming. Boom. The game's over, Dom. You lose. This is your last ride. Then you might want to buckle up. All right, that's a clip from Fast 10, the 10th entry in the Fast and Furious franchise. There's going to be one more because this is really the first half of the finale, and I'm Guarantee you we're going to get some spinoffs and prequels and stuff like that. But the franchise, as we know it, is finally coming to a close after some 10 movies. It'll eventually be 11 movies and more than $6 billion in worldwide box office. You know, if you go back to the original movie, The Fast and the Furious, believe it or not, was based on a true story, based on a, a magazine article about New York. Uh, street racing was a real scene. It still is a real thing in California, New York. They have it here in Chicago sometimes, you know, these illegal uh, uh, street races. The original film is actually kind of gritty and grounded. You know, it's about these guys. They're they're, they're street racers and they're they're thieves. And Paul Walker's Brian O'Connor is a, is an L.A. cop who goes undercover. So it, it's it's not this giant superhero adventure that these films became. I saw on a website that keeps track of these sorts of things. I think there were four deaths in The Fast and the Furious, and not all of them even occurred on screen. Now, of course, you get like 100 or 200. Who knows? Because there are some of these crazy, elaborate chase sequences through major metropolitan areas. Who knows how many innocent bystanders were taken out, which always adds a little heavy irony to the, you know, the inevitable finale of these fast and furious movies is they usually have a barbecue right a cookout and then dom toretto raises the product placement beer corona if you will uh although they have some stella artois in there sometimes too but usually the corona and then he gives the big speech about uh family i guess my vin diesel sounds more like my stallone but you know what i mean it's all about family and they all talk about yeah that that's the most important thing they never mention the fact that a lot of families are probably going to funerals at that time because they were killed somebody was killed not just henchmen but a lot of times it's police officers law enforcement who knows who else might be collateral damage but you know it's cartoon violence uh, and the fast and furious movies have gone to the point where they're deliberately ridiculous you know 
uh, whether it's, you know, the guys are taking, two guys are taking a, a Fiero into outer space or they're going up against tanks and submarines. Uh, I love when the cars are flying through the air and the guys still have their hands on the steering wheel and they're still steering the car as it's in midair, like it's a, like it's a spaceship. Uh, and that's just the way they are now. They're, they're over the top. They're excessive. Uh, they're bloated, and that brings me to Fast 10, which I'm not recommending. I gave it two stars in my written review. At the, you can get that at sometimes.com. I think for people who are into, you know, the the excess and the bloated madness of these movies, they'll probably dig it. You know, it's a lot of it's played for laughs. To me, this one, it's so it's it's well over two hours. It, it could have been trimmed by about a half hour. Uh, Jason Momoa is the main uh, antagonist this time around. He plays Dante Reyes. His father was killed in the movie Fast Five in 2011. He was a drug lord, and now this son wants revenge. I don't know why he had to wait 12 years for revenge, I guess, because they had to just wait for the right sequel. So Jason Momoa's Dante wants to tear the family apart and punish Dom and everybody else. Most of the main cast is back. Natalie Emanuel, Sun Kang, Jordana Brewster, uh, Tyrese Gibson, Ludacris, and then they have a lot of returning uh, guests. Of course, I should mention Michelle Rodriguez. She's Letty. She's married to Dom. That's one of the things with this with this film too. They, everybody's in it. You know, Helen Mirren character comes back. Charlize Theron. They got a new character from Brie Larson. Rita Moreno shows shows up as grandma, which means there are four Academy Award winners in this movie. It goes this way and that. The action sequences, as we mentioned, they're supposed to be completely logic-defying and implausible. They are, to me, the biggest problem was they went on forever. There's an early uh, action sequence set in Rome with a bomb, a giant bomb rolling through the streets of Rome like a giant bowling ball. And it just goes on forever as they try to figure out a way to stop this bomb. And then it does blow up, spoiler alert. And I'm assuming, you know, they always say, they always kind of cut to news reports in these Fast and Furious movies where some anchors like saying, miraculously, there were very few injuries. You know, then that's their way of kind of explaining it away. So, uh, and Fast X also has a couple of cameos. There's one in particular, I don't want to give it away, but it was really irritating and it's uh, a piece of stunt casting that'll take you right outside of the movie. And it also features somebody who's overexposed right now and I think would have been wise to turn down the cameo. It just gets some laughs, but then it's like, why is this person in the movie? And then there's some twists and turns and surprises. And also you may have read, and I'm not going to give it away, but there is a mid-credits appearance by a certain character that has everybody all, you know, a Twitter, if you will. Uh, if you're into these movies, that's great. I, I probably have liked about three, I think, in the franchise, three or four. Every once in a while, they hit the right notes, strike the right uh, balance between the cartoonish stuff and some some kind of, you know, well-acted performances. I mean, you do have people like Charlize Theron in these movies, but this to me was just, they're just going through the motions and they're spending a lot of money. And because they spent a lot of money, they don't want to leave anything on the cutting room floor. That's too bad. They should. All right. On to some good stuff. Uh, Platonic, I want to mention. This is from uh, Nick Stoller. He directed Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Bros. And uh, I really enjoyed this. This is an Apple TV Plus series uh, with Seth Ro with Seth, yes, yeah, Seth. I'm getting very sassy. Uh, with Seth Rogen and Rose Byrne, who of course were in Neighbors, which also was directed by Nick Stoller, and they're really terrific together, as the title implies. It's about a platonic friendship, and they're in their 40s. They've had their ups and downs. They've never been anything but friends. They're not friends with benefits. And their two characters now, after not talking to each other for five years, become friends again. And what I like about this series is that it doesn't get into when Harry met Sally territory, which is a, you know, a great and legendary rom-com. But that that asked the question, could men and women, could straight men and women be friends? And you know, the answer at the end was, according to that movie, no, because they fell in love. Uh, and here, that's never at issue. And I like that. Uh, the the other people, the other characters in the series, they might sometimes be a little threatened and kind of perplexed by these two people being such good friends, but they're not. Nobody ever thinks they're really together. Nobody that really knows them. They're friends. And two of them, the idea that they would be together romantically is nauseating and amusing. And I know a lot of you, I know I've been in this situation. When you have a friend like that, a lot of times people are like, really? And you're like, you don't understand. It's like a sibling relationship. This is very funny, very smart one of my favorite series of the year. 
platonic. And I also want to mention a film in theaters right now that's called You Hurt My Feelings. And this is very reminiscent of the kind of character-driven, uh, smart, dialogue-heavy comedy dramas of the 1970s. And because it's set in Manhattan, the obvious comparison is the best work of Woody Allen. This is from Nicole Holof Center, who's done a lot of really good stuff, a lot of really smart, sharp writing and directing. And I loved You Hurt My Feelings. Julia Louis-Dreyfus plays a writer. Uh, Tobias Menzies is her husband. He's a therapist. And it's very interesting because they're a middle-aged couple who are actually extremely happy together. In fact, they're still in love with each other, even though they've been together for like 25 years. But then there comes a moment where the character of Beth, played by Julia Louis-Dreyfus, overhears her husband saying that he doesn't really like her latest book, even though he's been telling her all along that he supports her. And it devastates her, and it feels like a betrayal, uh, almost on the level of an affair, because he's been telling her for a year he loves her work, and now she wonders what else has he lied to her about. So very intriguing premise, played for laughs, but also for great drama. One of my favorite movies of the year. You hurt my feelings, so you will hurt my feelings if you don't check it out. Happy anniversary. We're so lucky. Yeah. So, Elliot tells me you're a writer. In your last one, it should have done better. There's lots of new voices. Refugees, cancer, murder, abuse. I'm an old voice. You're the best voice. Maybe if Dad hadn't just been verbally abusive, it would have been a bestseller. Don't say that. Your memoir is great. Your new book is great. <gasps> Look. Come on, we'll go sneak up on him. Can you say anything? No, I can't. It feels too late. Oh, my God. Oh my Wait, God. Dad, I think I'm gonna throw up. Okay, right, 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 right here? No, I don't think I can. I can't. This whole world is falling apart, and this is what's consuming you. Well, you're not helping. I love you. Oh, okay, well, then never mind. All right, that's going to do it for The Richard Roper Show. Thanks to everybody, as always, especially my folks at AmericanEagle.com, and we'll talk to you soon.